Good evening. Thank you for being with us tonight. On behalf of Calgary Public Library, I welcome Royal Astronomical Society of Canada members and our patrons to this webinar lecture on Fuel Tank Waste Dump and Recycling Center, the Circumgalactic Medium Over Cosmic Time. We have here with us our moderator, Simon Poole from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. He will shortly be introducing presenter John O'Meara. I would like to acknowledge that we live on the ancestral and traditional indigenous territories of the Blackfoot Confeder Confederacy, Sixiga, Sitabi, Sixiga, Bigani, Gaina, and the people of the 37 region in Southern Alberta, which includes Sutina and Iyaha Nakoda, nations of Chiniki, Berspa, and Morley. The city of Calgary, Mokintisis, is also home of the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Uh, before we start, I would like to do some house, uh, Zoom housekeeping. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the lecture. Please ask your questions um, through the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. It's on the very right-hand side of your Zoom screen. And if you have any technical questions, you can ask those to uh, Calgary Library staff, Hamza, through the chat. And he will be taking only technical questions relating Zoom. And I will pass it to uh, Simon now. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for uh, joining us here today. I'm just gonna share my screen really quickly here. Um, well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our, uh, our, our, our special speaker event with the Calgary Public Library and the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's Calgary Centre. We are one of 29 centres across the country created to enhance understanding of and inspire curiosity about the universe through public outreach, education, and support for astronomical research. You do not need to live in Calgary or even in Canada to join our center. If you like this program and would like to support our nonprofit organization so we can continue to have more events like this, please don't hesitate to, uh, to, to, to join us. Um, you, your membership comes with the world-renowned Observer's Handbook. There's also a US edition for those at, at uh, lower latitudes. Also with the membership comes a subscription to the premier night sky magazine, Sky News and the Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, which contains the latest research into various astronomical topics. You will become a member of a community of professionals and amateurs who share a common passion for the night sky. Join us online for online social events, star parties, and now that the pandemic is uh, kind of going away, we're going to have some um, we're going to have some upcoming live events uh, where you can meet in person and uh, check out some of our telescopes. Um, we also have, you, ha, you'll have full access to a local t telescope rental program, which uh, bookings will once again be open on August the 1st for pickup the following weekend. So we're excited to announce that that program is now reopening um, in, in just a couple of weeks. And the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada also offers great observing programs where you can earn certificates and pins for finding certain, uh, a certain number of great celestial objects in the night sky. And before, as I, as I read the synopsis for this upcoming talk, I just like to, um, just like to have a, a quick poll put up just to um, help bring you uh, help to uh, understand our audience to um, be able to reach reach you with more programming. So as that's up, I'll just read the synopsis of this uh, of, of this talk this evening. In the last decade, the combination of observations from the Hubble Space Telescope and the largest telescopes in the world on the ground, along with state of the art simulations and theory, have shown that the regions of gas surrounding galaxies, the so-called circumgalactic medium, can dominate the history of galaxy formation and evolution over billions of years. In this talk, John will introduce the circumgalactic medium, 
show how our understanding has changed over the last few years and will describe the powerful new tools coming online that will take the study of the circumgalactic medium into the high precision era. John will also give us a brief tour of one of the most powerful observational tools we have on the ground to study the circumgalactic medium today, the Keck Observatory. John O'Meara is the chief scientist of the WM Keck Observatory, one of the most scientifically productive observatories on the planet. John is an observational astronomer and cosmologist with interests in galaxy formation and evolution. Experimental tests of Big Bang nucleosynthesis and federal science policy in the United States. John has a deep interest in developing future astronomical capabilities and is a science team lead for the LUVAR Space Telescope Mission concept. Please join me this evening in welcoming Dr. John O'Meara uh, to our, our center. Well, thank you very much, Simon. Um, it's really great to be here with everybody. Um, and uh, before I get started, uh, one of the things that I'd like to do is also acknowledge the place where I live and where I work, and uh, to acknowledge the very significant cultural role and reverence that the summit of Mauna Kea has uh, within the Indigenous Hawaiian community and, and uh, to everyone here on the island. And we're, we're most, most fortunate and privileged to have the opportunity to conduct great science and observations from this place, and it's, it's a very special place indeed. Uh, so what I'd like to do tonight, as, as Simon said, I'd like to do two things. I want to introduce you to, to uh, Keck, uh, the observatory, and then do a brief little historical tour through things and then and then start to talk about the, the circumgalactic medium. So what I'm going to do is hopefully get this to work right. And if somebody could just let me know whether or not it looks correct. Looks good. Looks, it good, looks John. good. All right. So uh, I'm really delighted to be here. I want to give a shout out to, uh, to Heather for getting this whole process started and introducing me to all the, the fine folks at the library and at RASC, it's, it's really great to be here. Um, before I get started on the CGM, I wanna get for a word from the sponsor, my boss, right? Which is the Keck Observatory. So shown here is uh, what happens at uh, just about this time of year, which is uh, when the observatory is, is really going to town on the galactic center. Um, and we use adaptive optics when we do this. Uh, that's why there's the lasers on. This is not CGI, these, these are real, uh, giant sodium lasers uh, bouncing off about 60 miles up in the atmosphere to create an artificial star so that we can study the inner part of the, of, of the Milky Way galaxy. And in fact, the, the 2020 Nobel Prize was awarded in part to Andrea Ghez, an astronomer from the University of California, Los Angeles, who's been using uh, the telescope on the left, followed by the telescope on, on the right, for over a quarter century to study the center of our Milky Way. Um, and, and tease out the fact that there is a supermassive black hole there, but that's a completely different talk for a different time. Uh, the, the observatory has a pretty simple mission. We, we ad advance the frontiers of astronomy and share our discoveries to inspire the imagination of all. And when people ask me, what do I do uh, as chief scientist? You know, my job is to advance the mission, is to be the main scientific liaison between all of our different stakeholders, our, our astronomical community, our, 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 our philanthropic places, our, our federal government that, that helps fund the observatory, our board, our, our, all, all the people who are interested in astronomy with Keck. My job is to sort of be the interface with them and to help advance our mission. So what does the telescope look like? Um, some of you know this. You can kind of see the telescope peeking out back behind me, uh, just above the, the dome slits here. But this is, this is the basic fundamentals of how the telescope works. Um, it is a segmented telescope. In fact, it's the first large segmented telescope of its kind on the planet, and it remains one of the very largest segmented telescopes on the planet. Why segmented? Because we couldn't actually build a single mirror this big. Um, it is a 10 meter telescope on average at the point to point, and parts of it, it's about 11 meters across. And it's made out of 36 hexagonal segments, each about a meter across and weighing about a thousand pounds. Those Segments are linked together in very much like a puzzle to make out a, a, a mirror figure. And one of the things that surprises me the most about this is that you know, this thing is 10 meters across and yet we know the left-hand side 
relative to the right hand side of that mirror to an accuracy of about 10 to the minus six meters uh, or even less sometimes. And that's just stunning to me um, that, that we can be that precise. Um, the, the telescope primarily sends its light to one of two places, either that deck where the blue rectangle is, the Naismith focus, where the light bounces off the primary, off the secondary, and off the tertiary, off to the side, because some of our instruments are very large and require them sitting physically on the deck. But we can also flip up or remove the tertiary mirror, the, the one in the middle, and send light down to the Cassegrain focus for lighter instruments. And whenever you remove a mirror bounce, you get more light. So we're always making the trade-off between how much light we get and how much precision we want. Um, the, another fun fact about the, the telescope is that it's a few hundred tons of steel and zero dur, the material that the mirrors are made out of, to basically move less than one soda can's worth of aluminum. We coat our mirrors in-house. Uh, we periodically take a segment out in a very delicate process. Uh, we crane over the, one of the segments, bring it down to the floor, bring it into a coating facility where we strip off the, the layer of aluminum that's there, um, stick it in a vacuum chamber and put a few atom layers, thickness of, of, of aluminum on the fresh mirrors and get them ready for work. But I, I really like knowing that there's less than a, a soda can's worth of aluminum uh, uh, at the business end of this telescope. Our instruments are very large. This is, this is a video showing the process of putting one of the instruments in. And there's you know, one of our, our summit technicians just to give you a sense of it, this is one of the smaller instruments that we have. One of the big brothers is sitting next to it. But we put these instruments in at the, at the deck during the day. Uh, we reconfigure the telescope. Um, in fact, we reconfigure both telescopes uh, or just about every day to get ready for, for optimizing science based off of what things are doing in the night. And we test everything out with the telescope during the day, et cetera, et cetera. You're here, you can see the primary mirror and uh, some of the instruments there on the deck. So it's kind of like a railway station during the day where we pull an instrument out, push it in. And most of our instruments are, are, are a few thousand pounds. And so uh, this is really precise work that's very difficult to do at 14,000 feet. For reference, that dome has kept the temperature that it's supposed to be during the night. And as a result is uh, just a little bit over freezing. Uh, and so working at 14,000 feet in nearly freezing conditions is very difficult work. And we have truly amazing staff that get us ready during the day. We have a combination of optical and infrared instruments. Here is one of our instrument builders uh, just after a successful refurb of one of our instruments. But uh, we, our bread and butter at Keck, at least today, is spectroscopy, um, usually of the farthest and the faintest objects that we can find. and so. We've used both optical and infrared wavelengths to look at some of the most distant objects in the universe and some of the faintest objects that we can point telescopes at. Um, but we have a community of instrument builders from across California, across the country, and uh, vendors and participants across the world to, to assemble these uh, bespoke single purpose instruments of which there is no, no double anywhere in the universe. That's the, um, that's the near spec instrument there. Uh, and there is no equal to it anywhere else. And so the development cycle for these things is oftentimes many, many years at a cost of many million dollars. What does it look like to observe at Keck? It looks like this. You have a lot of screens here, 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 lots of screens. Those last two arrows point at um, the, uh, our connection to the summit. Uh, which is where our telescope operator is driving the bus. Our observers actually are down at our headquarters facility because working at 14,000 feet is difficult. And um, we also have our staff astronomer who helps support things. We have meteorological data that's going on through the night. And most importantly, we have lots of coffee. Uh, some people ask, well, what did you do during COVID-19 when everybody had to work from home? The answer is we worked from home. You can tell this is working from home because you can see the Triscuits, the Doritos, the candy, and the all-important box of cat treats for whenever the cat comes by and tries to get me not actually observing. But this is what it looked like during COVID-19. We created what's known as pajama mode so that people could operate tech from home um, and, and actually do so successfully. But what it takes to facilitate an observation every night is a team working very, very well together. This is a recent staff photo of all of us here at our headquarters facility. We have over 100 employees here at Keck, and it is a very, very powerful team of some extremely smart people who work very, very hard um, to, to get us ready every night, just from the, from the technicians to the support astronomers 
to the engineers, to the software engineers, to the software designers, to everybody who keeps our facility uh, clean and operational. It, it takes that entire Ohana to be able to get um, the telescope operating and doing some of the best science on the planet. And it's, it's an honor and a privilege to work there. For reference, by the way, that green patch is exactly the same size as the primary mirror at Keck, if you wanna know how big the mirror is. Okay, let's switch gears. And now we'll finally start to, to talk about the CGM. If you hear me say CGM, that's because I forgot to call it the circumgalactic medium. CGM is just a, a shortening of, of that. And uh, I wanna give a little bit of historical context. In fact, a fair bit of historical context because observing the CGM is a very interesting thing um, because we have to observe it in very unique ways as you'll see in, in a bit. It's actually an extremely difficult thing to, to observe but it ends up being an absolutely critical thing to observe if you want to understand how galaxies work and how galaxies change over time. So let's go back to a slightly smaller telescope, uh, Galileo's telescope, and his observations of the Milky Way. You know, in addition to uh, observing the, the moons around Jupiter, the phases of Venus, the non-smoothness of the surface of the moon, Galileo did something extremely important, which is he aimed his, his, his rather crude uh, perspicillium or a telescope at the Milky Way and determined that it was made out of stars. Um, our eyes are unable to resolve that fact, but the, the, the telescope, even though it was fairly small, was able to show that gal to Galileo. And he remarked this in 1610 in Sidereus Nuncius, the starry messenger, that, that the, the Milky Way was actually made out of stars. And so almost overnight, both literally and figuratively, our concept of how big the galaxy was and what it was made of fundamentally changed because we now knew that this, this swath of stuff across the sky was in fact hundreds of millions, and eventually we would understand it to be hundreds of billions of stars. And what it took from that, for, to, to make that observation was new technology, it took a telescope. Fast forward about 170 years to Herschel, who attempted to make a, a map of the galaxy based off of what he had in terms of a significantly larger and more powerful telescope. Um, and this was Herschel's diagram of what he thought the Milky Way looked like in terms of uh, a distribution of stars, trying to get the distribution at the very center of that is where, where he thought the sun was. And you know, in 1785, attempting to map this out. And again, um, you know, he's, this is just a drawing, but the point is, is that the advances in telescope technology led to significant advances in our ability to characterize our, our Milky Way galaxy. It's an interesting thing about the Milky Way to, to understand its size and shape is actually very difficult because we're in it. Uh, and, and so when we look, we have a very strange view of the Milky Way being embedded in it. It's, try, it's like trying to understand a pizza if you're, if you're shoved in the crust and trying to, to get the, the idea of what a pizza looks like. And so, you know, in many ways, the history of understanding our own Milky Way and with it our own origins, at least cosmologically, um, is crucially dependent on our understanding of other galaxies because those are the only ones that we can look at over cosmic time um, to see what they actually look like in their full extent. And so if you were to fast forward to the early parts of the 20th, 20th century, our understanding of both our Milky Way and galaxies in general was still wildly incomplete compared to what we think we know today. And that led to something that was called the great debate. So the gentleman on the left had a, a giant debate with the gentleman on the right. This is Shapley and Curtis, who had a huge debate as to what some fuzzy things in the sky were. We knew of course of planets, of comets, um, we could see many nebulae like the Orion Nebulae, but telescopes had gotten large enough and, 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 and our capability to observe the sky robust enough that we could see many nebulae that were very, very regular in their shape, little spirals on the sky or, or very well-defined fuzzy blobs. And so the great debate was over whether or not those things were in fact other galaxies or if they were just nebulae within the Milky Way, right? And this had huge implications for the universe. It had huge implications for the size of our own Milky Way. If they were in fact nebulae within the Milky Way, the Milky Way had to be huge in extent, much, much larger than we actually know it to be today. Uh, but if they were separate galaxies, that means that the Milky Way is one but of but hundreds of billions of galaxies out there in the universe. And the debate raged on and they had very good arguments as to which one was which until um, Henrietta Swan-Levitt 
came up with a very interesting way of figuring out distances to very things which were very far away. And then a gentleman named Hubble pointed a very large telescope at our nearest large neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. And on the 6th of October, 1923, Hubble discovered a variable star, it's called a Cepheid variable. And using Henrietta Swan Leavitt's uh, way of calculating distances out there, um, determined that the Andromeda Galaxy was in fact millions of light years away from the Milky Way and effectively overnight ended the great debate and dramatically changed the scale of the universe. Uh, but that's really all that it did, at least at that time, right? With, because at that moment, we had uh, the ability to take wonderful images. We had the ability to take some spectra to understand things, but it's really going to be the development of spectroscopy that lets us understand what these galaxies are. In fact, a little bit before Hubble's measurements and before the great debate in the mid 1800s, I, I, you know, there's this quote by Auguste Comte, which says, you know, that basically we're never going to figure galaxies out, kids. They're too far away. You know, we can't even, we can't even figure out what the moon is made out of, let alone figure out what these galaxies are. You know, the best that we can do is stamp collecting, take images of them. And I delight in this quote because of how wonderfully wrong it is um, and how wonderfully arrogant it is because, you know, that's really the, the course of history is, is us arrogantly stating we will not figure this out or we definitely know what this is. And then science marching along and proving us wrong. And, and why I believe that is because we've actually been doing spectroscopy a very long time. Here's a lovely image of Mauna Kea um, and uh, a, a beautiful rainbow over it. Hawaii is, is world renowned for having so many rainbows. But rainbows are just spectroscopy writ large on the sky. And going back as far as, as Newton, we've had a systematic exploration of light and its constituent colors, right? If you look at optics, the, the great treaties by Newton way back in the day, pontificating on what light might or might not be and, and how it works when it interacts with materials. But as time goes on and our ability to build more powerful instruments, not necessarily telescopes now, but instruments to understand light, showed, for example, from Fraunhofer in, in the early 1800s that the light from the sun was not a contiguous rainbow. In fact, if looking in detail, and you can do this experiment yourself um, with, with an old compact disc, if you know what those are, I'm old enough to remember the, their predecessors and their predecessors' predecessors. But if you reflect light off of a compact disc and you have a lens looking at it, you can actually see some of these dark lines in the solar spectrum. And Fraunhofer cataloged these lines and found them to be quite regular, depending on when you looked at the sun. And over time, a series of, of understandings came about that this had to do something to do with the nature of what the sun was made of and um, the light passing through that material. And in fact, it's summarized here in Kirchhoff's laws. And th these are three laws which aren't laws. Science loves calling something a law when it's not. These are just three observations about things. Um, and, and it's important to, to focus in on this because it will have a very, very important impact in just a minute. Um, and according to, to, to Kirchhoff's observations, light, which comes from a hot, dense source, uh, will just show a continuous spectrum, a nice, perfect rainbow without any changes to it. Its shape is roughly determined by its temperature. On the other hand, if that same light, the exact same light, passes through a thin cloud of gas and you pass that through a prism, that continuous spectrum has little notches out of it. And the little notches are a result of being absorbed by something in the gas. But then the very curious observation is made that if you, instead of looking at the light source through the cloud of gas, look at the cloud of gas itself through a powerful spectrograph, you will see instead of notches out, you will see bright, bright spikes up at the exact same wavelengths, at the exact same frequencies of light that you saw in the absorption spectrum. And that's telling you something extremely important. And as the 20th century dawned, and as the, at the same time that the great debate was being settled, the understanding of why this happened came from in part these gentlemen, um, where we have Planck, Einstein, and Bohr describing the fundamental quantum nature of atoms. We now understand why those lines are at the exact same place. And it just has to do with how electrons move within atoms. If they get kicked up in energy, they have to um, absorb a certain amount of energy. And if they fall down in energy, they give off um, light at the exact same energy as the amount that they fell down in energy. But the interesting thing about atoms is that 
they're very much like ATM machines. An ATM machine cannot spit out $17.38. It can spit out $20 or $40 or $60. And so it is this quantization of ATM machines which actually applies to atoms as well. So you have to have a very, very specific energy to kick an electron up or if it falls down, it spits out a very specific amount of energy. And that's why there are these narrow lines. Light equals energy, and these lines are happening at the exact energies that these things are moving around. If you study these lines in detail, you can actually see that they are not perfect spikes. They have a shape to them. And it turns out that if you understand atoms, the quantum mechanics of how atoms work also determine that shape. And that shape tells you the exact temperature of the gas that is making that light. So by studying these lines, we can figure out the temperature of the gas. Now that's really powerful. Now I've now got two tricks. The first trick is that I know that specific atoms make certain lines at certain wavelengths. They're like fingerprints of the cosmos. They say, I am a hydrogen atom, so my lines are right here, but a helium atom has lines in a very different place. And so if I look at a cloud of gas, it's much like if I were to take this, this, this bottle and pass it around at a party and get everybody's fingerprints on it. And then I can determine who was there at the party if I spend a lot of time uh, doing some fingerprint analysis, although why you would be taking the fingerprints of your friends at a party is an interesting debate. Um, but if I now know what the gas is made out of, and if I now know what its temperature is, I now know two really important things about it. And if I study those lines in even more detail, I can figure out a third important thing about it, which is the Doppler shift. Um, if you've ever stood next to the train tracks, please next to not on. If you stand next to, to train tracks and you listen to a train go by, the pitch changes, it goes right? But if you're sitting on the train, it's just it's always the same noise. So why the difference? It's the relative motion between the two and the fact that sound is a consequence of waves. And so the relative motion between the observer and the train in this case causes a red shifting or a blue shifting of the sound. And that corresponds to a change in pitch. Light does the exact same thing. The unshifted lines of a spectrum, say helium or neon or argon or silicon, will sit there and have these, these lines on them. But if that source is moving towards us, it gets blue shifted. Those lines get moved a little bit to the blue. All the lines are the same spacing from each other, but a little bit to the blue. If it's moving away from us, it gets red shifted. So now I know three things. I know what the thing is, I know what its temperature is, and I know how it's moving relative to it, right? And so because of that, we now do spectroscopy in astronomy. And spectroscopy was the key thing. This is the spectrum of the sun. Please don't look at the sun. But if you do, and you happen to have a spectrograph in your back pocket, and it happens to be a spectrograph which weighs about six tons and sitting on the deck at Keck, this is what you would see. All of these notches out of these things are caused by absorption due to atoms in the outer atmosphere of the sun. And you know that big red one is hydrogen and many of the, the dark, the bigger uh, blue ones are iron. And in fact, most of the elements that we know on the periodic table appear here if you happen to know the fingerprint diagram. And if you want to turn this into uh, an intensity versus wavelength, how much light versus wavelength, that's what this is. This is a typical solar spectrum from the Kitt Peak Atlas for, for, for the sun. And um, you can see a couple of interesting things. You can see absorption due to our atmosphere, the oxygen bands. You can see uh, water bands and things like that. And this is critical for something not related to the CGM. This is how we tell what exoplanets are made out of. If you can get a spectrum of an exoplanet's atmosphere, you can do this analysis and say there's water in it, or there's there's uh, carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. In fact, you know that's that's going to be our best bet for figuring out whether or not there's life out in the universe. But this was a critical critical moment for astronomy in the early part of the 20th century because astrophysics is now born. Why is it critical? Well, okay, because of a truly truly profound theorem which I will attribute to myself. And that theorem is this, that the laws of physics are the same anywhere and any when in the universe. Well, why is that profound? It's because it now doesn't matter where this is. If atoms act the same here and in the Andromeda galaxy and in a distant galaxy 12 billion years in the past, if atoms act the same there then and everywhere, 
then I don't have to be anywhere near this cloud of gas. I just have to have a telescope and a spectrograph powerful enough to see these lines. And if I can do those things, then I can understand what it's made of, what its temperature is, and how it's moving relative to us. And I can do that anywhere in the universe I can make the observation. So what's incumbent upon us now is to build telescopes and spectrographs powerful enough to do this trick. Okay. One other final piece of trickery before I get to the circumgalactic medium. You've been very patient and I'm just asking for a little bit more patience. Um, let's pretend I'm going to now do this experiment with the ball of gas on now a cosmological scale. Distances far exceeding the separation between us and the Andromeda galaxy, billions of light years, right? So if I have a source very nearby, a QSO stands for a quasi-stellar object. It's basically code for a giant space light bulb. It's actually a supermassive uh, black hole in the center of a galaxy that's having material fall on it, heat up, get very, very bright. These are some of the most brightest, the brightest objects cosmologically in the universe. And if I have um, a fool standing next to a telescope who happens to be me at a telescope in Chile some years ago, and the light comes to me from this object, it will obey Kirchhoff's laws, even if it's very, very distant. Um, and it will give us that continuous spectrum of light because it's a hot, dense object. But on the other hand, if along the way, it smacks into a bunch of atoms, whatever the nature of those atoms are, it's going to put an absorption line on there, right? It's Kirchhoff's laws, the exact same as they were in the, in, in the lab, but now for a cosmologically distant object. But cosmologically distant objects are expanding along with the universe. And so really, instead of seeing that line where I would see it, if it was here in the lab, I see it redshifted. So now I can tell how this object is moving away from us along with the expansion of the universe, and I know what it's made of and what its temperature is. But the universe doesn't act that way. Between us and a very cosmologically distant object, they're not one, but hundreds, thousands, millions of objects. So the spectrum looks like this, even if it's the same atoms, if all of these blobs were made of the same atoms, their lines will appear in different places because they're moving away from us at different velocities. Um, Hubble's great observation about the expansion of the universe is that the farther away something is, the faster it's moving from us. But if that's true, distant ob objects at different distances from us moving with the expansion of the universe will have different amount of redshifted lines. And this is a tool that I've been using for most of my professional career called quasar absorption line spectroscopy. And this is what the real data looks like. For an object which is very close to us, Z is a number which corresponds to redshift. It's a cosmological way of talking about distance. Z equals zero means it's really close to us. Z equals infinity goes all the way back to uh, distance to the Big Bang. But Z of two, for example, is about 11 billion years in the past. So what do we notice? An object which is kind of close to us, Z of 0.1, a paltry three-ish billion years in the past, has a couple of notches out of it. But if I go much, much farther away to the quasar down below, its overall shape looks the same, but you see all of these notches out of it. And that's because on the way to us, the, the light from the quasar impacted thousands of pockets of atoms. Okay, finally, the circumgalactic medium. Our understanding of the circumgalactic medium has been a result of a three-pronged revolution. And uh, that revolution starts with a number of big ideas. This is a seminal paper from 1969 by John Bacall and Lyman Spitzer. Um, those of you who know space telescopes know that there was an infrared telescope which was recently turned off um, called the Spitzer Space Telescope. This is who it was named after. Um, and it, the abstract of the paper is one of the shortest abstracts that I know of, but also one of the most profound if you're trying to understand galaxies, which is that most of the absorption lines seen towards quasars are caused by gas in the extended outside regions of galaxies and the light happens to pass through them. An interesting note about uh, Lyman Spitzer and a running joke in this talk, I'll warn you now, is that no matter how smart you think you are, Lyman Spitzer came up with your idea first. Um, and we'll come back to this. But these pencil beam surveys, these tiny 
shafts of light coming to us from the quasars, this is Spitzer's interpretation of that. The light comes from the quasar, it's coming on its way due to, to, to Earth, and that all of these chunks out of the quasar light, say this one in particular, are the result of light passing through the outer regions of galaxies, halos of galaxies. And those halos of galaxies have been renamed the circumgalactic medium. Now, think about what I was doing with the preamble. If I can measure that thing, if I can measure those lines, then that means I now have a new tool. I can measure from absorption the, what the gas is made out of, what temperature is, and how far away it is. All I need is a telescope big enough to see the quasar and an instrument powerful enough to record those lines. And that's where the second revolution comes in, which is big glass. Observatories like Keck, the most powerful ones on the planet, allow you to see more quasars, more bright objects in the background sky. And if we can see more bright objects in the background sky, we can do better and better and better and better statistics because you never want to measure one, something once, right? In this game, to really talk about galaxies and galaxy evolution, you ideally want to do it thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of times. And so you need a very, very powerful telescope. One thing I forgot to mention, but I should about quasar absorption line spectroscopy is that it's wonderful in the sense that it is independent of how bright the object emitting the light was. If I go back to this diagram, that big chunk there is independent of how bright the galaxy is that surrounds it because we are absorbing the light, not emitting it. All I need is a telescope powerful enough to see the background light bulb. I don't have to be able to see the foreground galaxy. And that's really important because even a telescope as powerful as Keck cannot see most of the galaxies in the universe. They're too faint. So big glass allows us to find those quasars. Big instruments on those telescopes allow us to study the gas at very high sensitivity, which means the ability to really understand the physics inside that gas. And the third part of the revolution is big silicon. Um, bonus points if you recognize where this image comes from. Um, we have developed hand in hand with observational tools like telescopes and instruments, the ability to simulate, simulate the universe inside a computer. Why do we do that? Well, that's because astronomy is very unique amongst the sciences. If I do a chemistry experiment, I go into a chemistry lab, I put substance A into substance B, it goes, <laughs> explodes. And you say, huh, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if it does it a second time. You do it the second time, it goes, <laughs> and you say, now, great, I understand some, uh, something, substance A and substance B. What if I change B a little bit? And you go, mm, all right, now I've really learned something about it substance A and substance B. Aside from the dumb noises, the important thing in that experiment is that I could redo the experiment. The problem with astronomy is that there is only one universe and we live in it. So the way to get around it, to try to see if you understand galaxies, their surroundings and their evolution is to try to create baby universes inside of computers, input all the laws of physics that you know, how atoms work, how many atoms you think there are, how much dark matter and dark energy you think there are. Those are two completely different talks, right? And all of those things start the universe off when it's very young, let it evolve over time and see whether or not you get galaxies that look like they do today. So this is a good example of that. I'm gonna run through the universe at a time when it was only maybe 50 million years after the bang and evolve it up until the present day and to see whether or not we get galaxies that look like our own. So in the very early times of the universe, right, there's not actually much going on. That's because stars haven't turned on yet. But when they do, boom, they light up the universe and then galaxies, which are the places where these little bright knots are, start to turn on their stars. And when they do, they start to heat up their surroundings. They start to produce new heavy elements. And they really start to leave their imprints on their surroundings. That pink color means the gas is well over a million degrees. And uh, so we're, we see that as time changes, those pink blobs are getting bigger and eventually it, you get to a galaxy that kind of looks like ours today. Um, and that is, at least in a simulation sense, what we expect galaxies to do over cosmic time. We expect them to grow. We expect their stars to impact their surroundings. And we now have something we can test. The only problem with this is that to test it experimentally, yeah, 
our friend Lyman Spitzer pointed this out in 1956, that we, can, we have to look at a million degree Kelvin gas. Now our eyes and even Keck telescope can't look at that gas. At least you can't look at that gas in this room because at a million degrees, primarily you're giving off light and x-rays. And it's a good thing that we don't have a million degree gas in this room for a variety of reasons, but our telescopes on the ground are incapable of seeing that because the atmosphere eats all the x-rays. But remember what I said about redshift. If it's moving away from us, there's a chance you can see it. If it's moving away from us fast enough, those lines of oxygen, which Spitzer correctly points out are at about a thousand angstroms. A thousand angstroms is the far ultraviolet. Your eyes see from about 4,500 angstroms to about 7,500 angstroms. A thousand angstroms is way off into the far ultraviolet. Those lines, if you are redshifted enough, can move up to 4,500 angstroms. So, you know, this gas peaks at temperatures that we can't see, but if we have a big enough telescope and an expanding enough universe, we can get lucky and study galaxies very early in the universe who've been redshifted to the point where a telescope like Keck can study the gas because the wavelengths have been redshifted into the optical. But there is a problem with this. The first problem is that this is what galaxies look like in those simulations. If you look only in the starlight, you see a bunch of galaxies and you can kind of see the filamentary structure, the so-called cosmic web of the universe. You can see a couple of big galaxies next to each other, a couple of small satellites surrounding them. But that is not where most of the atoms are. Most of the atoms in the universe are not in stars. On truly cosmological scales, 99% of the atoms in the universe are out in the space between galaxies and even between the in between of galaxies, the intergalactic medium. But if you ask where most of the atoms are that we could measure through Spitzer's technique, they're here. They're surrounding the galaxies. That's the problem. The galaxies are the things which are bright enough for us to see with telescopes. Their surroundings are not. And in many cases, if you're looking at galaxies nearby to us, we want to understand how galaxies change from all of cosmic time. If you want to look at galaxies which are close by enough to us to understand the morphology of the galaxy, how stars are distributed in it, how gas is distributed in it, it needs to be close by. But if it's close by, you're operating in the far ultraviolet. So what's the solution to that? It's the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope, by virtue of being in low Earth orbit, does not have the atmosphere blocking all that light. And so if you can put a telescope in space, and if you can make an instrument on it that can see an ultraviolet light, you can study the circumgalactic medium in nearby galaxies. And remember, those are the galaxies that we can study in great detail by other means to figure out where the stars are and all that stuff. Oh, and by the way, Spitzer predicted this too. In 1946, this is one of the most fabulous papers to read. It's a, it's a thing submitted to the Rand Corporation by Spitzer in 46. He highlights the reasons why we have the Hubble Space Telescope today. Um, so yeah, like I said, if you have a great idea, Lyman Spitzer probably came up with it. So what is the emergent picture now? If I take all three of these things in the three-pronged revolution and I ask, what do galaxies look like? The answer is galaxies do not at all look like what you see when you look at images of galaxies. The extent of galaxies and the nature of the gas in them goes far, far beyond the starlight. So uh, that central galaxy in the center of this image is where the stars are. And 15 kiloparsecs means 15,000 parsecs. A parsec is about three light years. So galaxies are about 100,000 light years across if it's a galaxy like the Milky Way. But notice that the gas that we infer from both the telescopes and the theory extends well beyond that, extends to a million light years way out, factors of 20 bigger than the galaxy itself. And that's the circumgalactic medium. The emergent picture that comes out of these simulations is that it's a combination of gas that's falling into the galaxy, gas that's being shot out of the galaxy when the galaxy has supernovae and star formation, those explosions send gas out. And sometimes if it doesn't send the gas out with enough velocity, it falls back onto the galaxy. So this is why I called it the, the waste, dump, uh, waste dump fuel tank and recycling center, because it has all three of those processes locked up in the circumgalactic medium. And so that tells me that if I really want to understand how galaxies work, 
that's where I need to look because that's where the gas that fuels stars is coming from. So I don't have enough time to go through all of the things that the CGM has taught us, but I do want to talk about one of the most important things it has because it's very fun. Um, a, a, a very fun conundrum is the following. Uh, how do galaxies like our own, here is a galaxy that's somewhat similar to the Milky Way, uh, that are forming stars today. So this galaxy is forming stars. How do I know that? I see a bunch of blue light that's caused by big bright blue stars. Big bright blue stars only live for a very small amount of time in universe time. And so if I can see blue stars, then that means that thing is still forming galaxies, even if that galaxy is 10 billion years old. This is true in the Milky Way. The Milky Way is you know, 11 to 12 billion years old, gauged by some of the stars in the outside of the halo, but stars are still forming in the Milky Way. You know this in, uh, if you go outside and look at the Orion Nebula. There are stars forming in the trapezium, right? And the trapezium is a bunch of bright young stars. So how do galaxies like our own fuel star, star formation? Well, you could say, well, they just have a fuel tank. But there's the problem. If I look at a galaxy like this and I add up all the gas inside of it, inside this image, if I add up all the gas that's creating stars, stars are formed by gas collapsing, fusion turning on, boom, you've got a star. If I add up all the gas that I can see in this image, that can run, that can run star formation for about a billion years. But there's 12 billion years worth of stars in this galaxy. Somehow the galaxy kept refueling itself, right? But other galaxies are effectively dead. Elliptical galaxies like this one, that boring brown color is a result of the fact that there are no stars forming in this galaxy anymore. And the fun thing is those two galaxies are the same age, roughly speaking. So why are some red and dead? And why are some still forming stars? Uh, Hubble noticed this difference between galaxies, but he did so in the shapes of galaxies. And the Hubble tuning fork diagram says, well, some galaxies are just kind of spherical blobs, the elliptical galaxies, and others have these beautiful spiral arms. Uh, but it turns out the ones with the beautiful spiral arms are the ones that are forming stars and the blobs are the ones that are not. But Hubble didn't have the tools to understand why this was. And so, you know, here are the elliptical galaxies and the spiral galaxies and then the oddballs like the large and small Magellanic clouds. So how do I test the theory that the circumgalactic medium is the place where we get the extra gas to fuel stars? Well, if I have a background light source, the quasar, and the light from the quasar happens to pass through the circumgalactic medium on its way to an observable for us, what can I do? I can tell you what it's made out of, what its temperature is, and how it's moving. I can tell you whether or not it's falling into the galaxy or getting shoved out. I can tell you whether or not it has heavy elements in it, which are indicators of star formation. I can tell you whether or not it's cold. Cold gas is what you need to form stars. So if I'm lucky enough to have a background light source like a quasar near a galaxy, I can do this trick. And so what do I need to do? First thing I need to do is find a lot of quasars next to galaxies. That's what the Sloan Digital Sky Survey did. They found about a million, a, million, a million quasars out there, some of them bright enough to play this trick with. But those, what we really wanted to do is find quasars, the blue thing there in the center, that have galaxies really close to it on the sky. And if I know that the quasar is farther away than the galaxy, I can hopefully probe the circumgalactic medium of those galaxies. Remember, the simulations say if this is the galaxy, the CGM goes way out. So in principle, I could create a sample of galaxies, some of which we know are forming stars and some of which we know are dead. Look at how they're distributed spatially near that line of sight and ask, what is the CGM made of? What is its temperature and how is it moving? for each one of those sight lines. And I can look at it at various distances away from the, the center of the galaxy and probe the extent, nature, and speed of the CGM. But I need to do it in ultraviolet. So I put a spectrograph on Hubble and I find these lines of oxygen that Spitzer back in 56 said, hey, you really need to do that. And we did in large quantities. And this is what we found. I apologize, this is the one plot in here. All you need to know about this plot is the following. If you move to the right on this plot, that means you're forming more stars in the galaxy. And we figured that how many stars the galaxies were forming by aiming keck at them. 
And if you're going up, that means you have more and more of this oxygen that Spitzer said you should look for in the far ultraviolet. And that's what we measured with Hubble. Now, you should notice something obvious about this. All of the star forming galaxies are in the upper right and nearly all of the red and dead galaxies are in the lower left. So when we do this experiment, we find that star forming galaxies all have a bunch of oxygen in their surroundings and red and dead galaxies don't. And so what that means is that somehow the red and dead galaxies had a period of star formation so violent that it drives both, it drives the gas completely out of the galaxy and it has no recycling, no inflow of stuff anymore and has stopped forming stars. And that this event happened at some point billions of years in its past. On the other hand, other blue bright galaxies, the star forming galaxies, get their material falling back on them. They get cosmic recycling and inflow of pure gas. And we get continued star formation over billions of years. And this was only possible because of the combination of an ultraviolet sensitive telescope in space and a giant telescope on the ground. Right, and our emerging theoretical concepts of what the CGM will look like. I need to take my digression and do a really bad Carl Sagan impersonation, you know, which is we are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. Right, Carl's beautiful intuition here was something absolutely powerful and wonderful about astronomy, which is that we are made of the remnants of a, of a generation of stars that preceded our sun and that material traveled throughout the interstellar medium, collapsed to form our sun and the solar system. And so we really are a way of, of heavy elements understanding ourselves. But here's the fun thing. Those blue dots in the upper right in star forming galaxies are oxygen. And what this result tells us that if you are in a galaxy that is still forming stars, you have a huge amount of galaxy in your surroundings. And if you add up and, and do the math on it and spend a lot of time hemming and hawing over it, you come up with a very fun result, which is half of the oxygen you're breathing right now came from outside the Milky Way, not from stars within it. It came from the circumgalactic medium. So not only are you made of star stuff, you're made of circumgalactic and intergalactic stuff. And that is an extremely fun result of the mid 2010s. Um, we can play this game now over cosmic time. I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but one of the things that you want to do now is using this trick for galaxies which are kind of nearby, look at galaxies farther and farther away, which means more and more distant in the past. And eventually you should find galaxies whose circumgalactic medium have no heavy elements in it at all because the universe couldn't have formed stars then. They're sort of the sacred unicorns out there, things which have no heavy elements in them. Um, we did this measurement with Keck and detected a couple of pockets out there in the universe that have absolutely no heavy elements in them. And this is a critical anchor point in this emerging model of the CGM. I'm running out of time here, but I do want to say a couple of words about how we're going to do this even better in the future. And I think there's two tools that are really important to do it. The first has to do with gravitational lensing. I mentioned before that studying the CGM is really difficult because you need to get lucky enough to have a quasar near a galaxy. What if I didn't need a quasar? What if I could look at the galaxy itself? If I could look at the galaxy itself, I could directly study its CGM and I could study the CGM of galaxies in between us and that background galaxy and the same trick that we use with quasars, but now with background galaxies. But I also told you that galaxies are faint. Well, there's one time that galaxies aren't faint, and that's if they're gravitationally lensed. A bunch of background galaxies passing through a huge amount of matter can have their light distorted, stretched out on the sky, and made brighter. That process of gravitational lensing allows us to now look at galaxies instead of quasars, and we can look across the face of the warped galaxy to try to understand its CGM. Here is a beautiful example of that. This is a, a gravitational lens where there are six images of the same quasar due to lensing at about 13 billion years in the cosmic past, maybe 12 and a half. And that arc, that smudge, that blue smudge called A1 is a gravitationally lensed galaxy in front of those quasars. So each one of those sight lines can probe the CGM of that galaxy. And this is something we're actively working on today with data from Keck, and I would love to show it to you but we just submitted a paper on it and I don't want to get my collaborators in trouble. 
But the most effective way to do it is to do it. We would love to be able to directly image the CGM, which is very, very faint, but still puts off light. Go back to Kirchhoff's laws, those emission lines. Instead of looking at it in absorption, doing an emission. But for that, I need a very, very big telescope, and I needed to see in the ultraviolet. And that's why we want to build this. It's no moon. It's a space telescope. This is the Louvoir space uh, mission, uh, space telescope mission concept. It's basically putting Keck in space. This is a 15 meter telescope end to end um, with a suite of instrumentation as powerful as any of the ones that we have on the ground. But because it's in space, put it out at L2 where James Webb is gonna go. It's going to be the most powerful thing we can do with a single launch, cram it in the largest, the largest rocket I can, build this giant telescope and go after the CGM in a mission. Now you could say, wow, that's really awesome. Who came up with that? Uh, Lyman Spitzer did in 1946, because he pointed out that if you can make a telescope 450 inches in diameter, which is about 11 meters, you could go after all these things and more. So I'll close with just reminding you of why it's important. Um, if you want to understand the Milky Way, if you want to understand how we got to this point, we now apparently should not be studying the insides of the Milky Way. We should be understanding its surroundings. A fun fact, the CGM is so large that we actually share part of our circumgalactic medium with the Andromeda galaxy's circumgalactic medium. That's a new result from Hubble. So we're actually co-mingling the circumgalactic media of these galaxies as they start to come in. But really, if you want to understand galactic history, how galaxies evolve, how they start star formation, how they stop it, and, and what happens, you don't need to look at the stars. You need to look at this region. And the future is very bright to understand it even better. I'll close with an image of one of the tools that makes it happen. And you may be some of the first people on the planet to hear this. But it's my understanding from my vast, vast network of spies at the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute that the crossover between side B and side A electronics, you may have heard that Hubble's been out of commission since June, that that crossover was successful and we anticipate Hubble should be doing science again uh, as early as this weekend. And with that, I will say mahalo nui loa, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you have. I'll stop my sharing. Thank you so much. That was such a, such a great presentation. Uh, absolutely amazing. And we do have quite a few questions here. Um, to ask you. Um, somebody asks about working at uh, 14,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And I know we talked about this before the presentation, but um, is supplemental oxygen needed by the staff? Um, yes, I mean, it depends It depends on the staff member. So as, as I was explaining to Simon before we got started, uh, you know, when I used to go up to the summit 20 years ago, um, I would you know just be, hey, look at me, I'm great at the summit, but now I'm kind of an old guy and uh, I'm starting to feel the effects of it. So I actually carry a, a supplemental oxygen unit. Um, it's about 50-50 in terms of the usage. Uh, I think the really impressive thing is not me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an administrator. They don't let me touch anything. But that the people who, who push those instruments in and out of the telescope and who do that extremely precision work with very heavy, big things, do that at 14,000 feet, zero degrees Celsius, and very little oxygen. So it's truly impressive to see them work. Many of them use oxygen, many of them don't, but it's a nasty place to work. But the reasons are that this is one of the best places on the planet to do astronomy. You know, you're at 14,000 feet, you're looking through less atmosphere. The atmosphere over Mauna Kea is, is very still and uh, the conditions just unrivaled for certain types of astronomy on the planet. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, we have a we have a question. Is there any astrobiology research being performed at the Keck Observatory? Yes. So uh, that's a wonderful question. Um, right now, we are at a very we're, we're at a huge transition point in in the study of, of exoplanets, which is we've gone from proving that they exist at all, which is something that happened in the 1990s, to now having many thousands of them understood, to being able to now go to the point where we can really do populations analysis of what, how many exoplanets are as big as the Earth or, or Neptune or Jupiter, how many are close to their star, how many are, are in a habitable zone or, or in a solar system similar to our own. But to go to, to, the, to the question, we're now getting really good at building the tools we'll need to study the actual atmospheric content of these stars, uh, sorry, of these planets. And one of the reasons for building that LUVOR space telescope 
is because it would be powerful enough to really do a deep dive into those, uh, those uh, atmospheres and look for the fingerprints of life. It's a very difficult measurement to make, just to give you a couple of, of order of magnitude things. Um, if you look on the sky, if you were 30 light years away from the sun and you looked on the sky at the sun and you looked at earth next to it, if you were you know, looking for earth, trying to understand it, the difference, the spacing on the sky between the earth and the sun is about the width of a human hair at arm's length if your arms are 200 meters long. So they're very, very close to each other in the sky, which means you need a very large telescope to be able to separate those two things on the sky. The other problem is that the star is about 10 billion times brighter than the reflected light of the planet. And so if you were to look at the brightest spotlight on, uh, on, on Earth um, from Los Angeles, and it's in New York, it's like trying to find a firefly inside that beam. It's if the firefly is a thousand times brighter than fireflies usually are. That's a long-winded way of saying this is a difficult problem, but for some exoplanet systems, it's not that difficult. And the answer is yes, we're building an instrument right now whose purpose in life is to actually go after biomarkers and atmospheres for a certain type of stars. And we're doing a lot of the precursor work for, for astrobiology here at Keck. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really awesome. Um, do the central black holes of galaxies play a role in circulating gas into and out of a galaxy through the uh, circumgalactic medium? Yes, they do. Um, the formation of those supermassive black holes, particularly when galaxies smack into each other, that distribution of mass and central concentration of mass drives in many ways the way that the atoms follow the, the unseen matter, the dark matter and the supermassive black hole, and that can influence the CGM. Um, right now for the Milky Way, for example, the black hole at the center of the galaxy is thankfully quite quiescent and is not, not doing a lot of, of beaming of energy back out through its poles out. Um, that's, we call those jets. Those jets can add heat and, and energy to the CGM, change its nature, change its distribution. It's not doing that for the Milky Way or Andromeda, which is really good because we don't want that happening with the Milky Way right now. But yes, it's a, it's a great question. The, the supermassive black holes can leave their imprints on the CGM. Cool. Um, in, your, in your spectral analyses, how do you distinguish between absorption lines of particular elements in a galaxy and the absorption lines caused by the intervening circumgalactic medium? Ah, great question. Uh, the answer is that if I have a, 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 a spectrograph powerful enough, it can see this slight separation between those two because of the relative motion between the CGM and the galaxy and us. Now, if the CGM is sitting right on top of the galaxy and the galaxy isn't moving relative to us, then we can't disentangle it. But if there's slight relative motion between those two, then those two will separate and you can actually see that separation. If you have a, a fine enough resolution spectrograph, you can disentangle those two. Um, but in most cases, when we look at galaxies, particularly very, very distant ones, we're looking at the emission lines and in the CGM, we're looking for the absorption lines. So we get to play this game of uppy downy and the downy is usually the CGM and the uppy is, is the galaxy. That's a very scientific term, by the way. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, does recycling in the circumgalactic medium mean there's a uh, continuous nucleosynthesis happening that allows the cycle of birth and death of stars? Yeah, so that, that, that's, that's a great question. So this, this, this inflow, this inflow of fresh material that's cold enough um, to eventually forge stars is exactly what the galaxies need to form the next generation. So our Milky Way would not be forming the stars we see in Orion today if it wasn't for a billion years ago, some stuff coming in from the CGM and filling up that fuel tank enough to, to form the stars. Now, in some cases, stars explode, send that out into the CGM, and that falls back in. So that's why I say about half the oxygen you're breathing came from the circumlactic medium, and half of it just came from the interstellar medium from the local bubble of stars eight to seven billion years ago that went through their life, ended their life cycle, spread that material out in the interstellar medium. So it's about a half and half admixture. But yeah, the, the, the CGM is what's responsible for giving us about half the heavy elements and half the raw material we need for stars. Cool. 
Um, you mentioned about building a telescope in space, um, mm -hmm. Lagrange point two. Um, somebody asks, um, why not build a telescope on the moon? Oh, uh, well, it's a great question. Why not build a telescope on the moon, particularly on the far side of the moon where it's very, mm -hmm. very dark. Um, and in the poles on the moon where it's permanently dark, the, the sun grazing angle is, is below the horizon. So you can't, you don't get any light in there. Um, the problem is A, actually how you build it. Um, if you want to build a telescope on the moon, you're presumably going to build one that is large enough that warrants going to the moon instead of a rocket taking it to L2. And the larger a telescope is, the more and more stable it has to be. I'd mentioned that Keck is stable up to, you know, many tenths of uh, 10 to the minus six meters. Louvoir has to be sensitive to 10 to the minus 11 meters um, to the left and right hand side. So even bigger than that means even more stable. And the moon actually has moonquakes, small amounts of, of uh, rumbling in there. So your, your telescope structure has to be super rigid, but if it has to be super rigid, then you really have to do a lot of work to build it. If you have to do a lot of work to build it, you have to get stuff there. It's rather expensive. There is one caveat. Oh, well, there, there's, there's one other reason, which is close, very close to the surface of the moon because of moon dust and various other things. It's actually bad for ultraviolet astronomy. The, the, the local dust environment eats up most of those ultraviolet photons, or at least the re, you know, to the sensitivity levels of why you would want to build a big telescope. The one place this doesn't apply is in the radio. You could actually build a, a big radio telescope on the far side of the moon, and there have been proposals to do this, and it's a, it's a very interesting place to do it because it's the far side of the moon, always facing away from the Earth. It's never subject to the nasty, stupid radio interfer interference that we dump out to the rest of our local surroundings because it, the moon does a great job of absorbing most of that noise, and so it's a, it's a perfect place to do it. Well, that's, that's really interesting. No, thanks. thanks for that answer. Um, somebody asks, could the circumgalactic medium um, influence minor galaxies such as the Magellanic Clouds? Yes, absolutely. In fact, it, um, in two ways. So if I look at the Magellanic Clouds, galaxies like the Magellanic Clouds are violently forming stars, much more so per year than galaxies like our own, which means they have a huge impact on their local CGM because it's shoving tons of stuff out there surrounding the galaxy. Um, which means it's oftentimes very hard to have that fresh star formation come in and eventually the fuel tank might run out and that galaxy might transition in a different way. The other thing that's happening to the uh, large and small Magellanic clouds is they're plowing through the CGM of the Milky Way. So they're commingling with our CGM and eventually those things are going to merge with the Milky Way. And so we can actually see a stream <laughs> across the sky of that material from the CGM that got stripped from the, the passages of the L, uh, LMC and, and SMC. So yes, smaller galaxies, satellite galaxies can really both impact their own CGM, but be impacted and impact the CGM of the galaxies they, they orbit around. It's a great question, they, they definitely do. Awesome. Um, observation of elliptical and spiral galaxies tells us about uh, the star formation of a galaxy. So which influences which? Does the shape of a galaxy influence the star formation rate or the other way around? A fantastic question that I don't know the, the complete answer to, but I'll spitball. Um, one of the other things that can shape, change the shape of a galaxy is an interaction. So when the if, if the simulations are to be, be believed in a few billion years, when Androm Andromeda and the Milky Way merge, there's gonna be a huge amount of star formation because of the smacking together of the CGM, the gas in those galaxies making star formation. But after a while, it'll coalesce down and merge into roughly a fuzzy ball, mm -hmm. an elliptical galaxy. That violent merger can play the same role as supernova in stripping away the CGM. So the shape of that galaxy, the fuzzy ball, which is caused by the gravitational settling of these two things over billions of years, is intricately linked to the fact that it expelled huge amounts of gas. And so it's, it's, it's really sort of a push me pull you. There's, um, in terms of spiral galaxies and star forming galaxies, not all star forming galaxies are spirals. That's the first hint to your answer. The large and small Magellanic clouds look like a dog's breakfast. They have no regular shape. They're just a pile of stars, right? They're weird looking things, but they're violently forming stars. Um, all spiral galaxies have star formation going on in them because all spiral galaxies still have gas in them. 
Um, but it is not the spiral. I don't believe it's the spiral shape that drives that star formation. The spiral shape is a, is a, is a, is a function of the gravitational interaction of different distributions of clumps inside the thing that eventually gain a nice spiral shape. But it's, uh, it's a great question that I really don't know the full answer to, so I'm spitball. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. Um, were most of the images shown taken as raw photographs from the telescope with visible light and were extended exposure times ever required? Um, so most of the, most of the images of the galaxies are done in, in invisible light, except for when they're not. When we use ultraviolet wavelengths, we'll take images of the galaxies in ultraviolet as well. And it's, and it's important to remember that when Keck looks at a galaxy that's 10 billion light years away, it's looking at it in the ultraviolet light made by the galaxy. But because it's moving away from us, it gets shifted into the visible light. Um, in terms of the exposure time and all that stuff, um, those exposure times can range from minutes to many hours. Um, and in most cases, it's stacks of many, 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 many images because we want to get rid of noise. Noise makes things uh, harder to understand. And so these are the faintest objects that you can out there. And so it's a stack of many, many images. I don't know if that's a complete answer to your question, but um, I hope it helped. No, oh, great, thanks. Um, if the light we see is um, from millions and uh, millions and even billions of light years away, how, how do we know if those stars are still alive? Oh, wonderful question. Um, it is certainly the case that some of the stars that you can see with your eye today are from stars that are no longer there, but not many. We're still talking, most of the stars that you can see are, are fairly local to us in the Milky Way, maybe tens of thousands of light years at maximum. Um, there's the Milky Way itself, which over cosmic time, if you sit there and wait long enough, you'll see a supernova explosion, the violent death of, of a star. Um, but how can I know if those stars are still alive? Stars, even though they look pretty constant with time, their ratio of heavy elements will change over time. By studying the temperature of that gas, we can tell whether or not the star is expanding or contracting or in, in radial velocity. So a fascinating star to watch is Betelgeuse. We can actually see it getting larger and smaller. Um, and if we can tell from that, that it's in that stage of its life, we know within a few million years, Betelgeuse is gonna explode. Now, what I can't tell you is whether or not it's a few million years or a few million years plus three days. You know, Betelgeuse could already be gone. It's, it's unlikely with Betelgeuse, but I think um, there's a couple of other ones that may have, Eta Carinae may have already exploded. And unfortunately, it'll be in the south because it'll be as bright as the moon during the daytime, and it's going to be awesome. Um, but mostly the answer to the question is, is we understand uh, the stellar atmosphere physics well enough to tell whether or not something's near the end of its lifetime, because stars act very differently when they're close to the end of their lifetime compared to a steady state star like our sun, right? Our sun is, is very much similar to it as it was a billion years ago. It's a little bit brighter, um, but otherwise the atmosphere is acting almost exactly as it did a billion years ago. In five billion years, it's going to be really different. It, you know, it, it, its atmosphere will extend out to, uh, you know, beyond Mars, and so it's not going to be a fun place uh, to be here on Earth. But that's okay. It's many billions of years from now. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's what I tell the the kids when I teach them their astronomy classes on Saturday mornings. <laughs> they always ask that. Um, is there any similarity between our solar system's influence, um, for instance, like the heliopause and bow shock, et, et cetera? It's a good question. I, um, you know, the heliopause, the bow shock, et cetera, have, you know, are largely a consequence of the extent of, you know, the light pressure of the sun, the magnetic mm -hmm. field of the sun and things like that. And so it's, it, and, and also the environment of stuff plowing into it, right? If there was nothing else, it would be much harder to, to, tell that there's a heliopause and a low shock. Um, so in that regard, it's similar to the CGM in that uh, the CGM of our galaxy is influenced by Andromeda. Is there any of the nearby galaxies? And there's uh, light pressure coming in, light pressure coming out. But I think the fundamental physics of the thing that makes the shape of the solar system's outer extent and the shape that makes the CGM are pretty different. Most of the, most of the physics driving that are pretty different. 
The one thing that happens though, that we don't know the answer to, and this is what astronomers often do when they don't know the answer to something is they invoke magnetic fields because we don't understand magnetic fields very well and how magnetic fields drive both the Beauchamp and heliopause and how they interact with the CGM are very poorly understood, particularly on the CGM side. <clears throat> Great. Um, here's a question. Uh, what is the advantage of hexagonal versus, say, oct octagonal segments for a segmented mirror? It's largely how you pack it and the precision with which you have to cut the edges. Um, and a, a hexagon pretty easily maps onto a, a, a a, a pseudo circular aperture once you get large enough. I mean, I think I think it's largely just the the packing of all the hexagons next to each other in terms of the gap space in between the segments. You can really cram them in there. Where whereas with a with an octagon, the cramming in I think becomes more difficult. And you want to have a big telescope, but as few segments as possible. Because what I didn't show you is on the back end of that mirror, each of the segments has a warping harness that can change the shape of the mirror, which is what we do during adaptive optics observations. But now the mirror has six degrees of freedom. It's, you know, X, Y, Z, and then velocities in each one of those. And then I do that times 36, and I start to run into a bit of a computational problem. In fact, when the telescope was built, um, one of the reasons why people think it wouldn't work is because the computers that would need to calculate the actuation of the mirrors didn't exist at the time that they started building the telescope. So they trusted in Moore's law to be able to handle it. Today, our iPhone can drive the segment motion of, of Keck, but whenever you add more and more complexity to a system, it becomes harder to maintain, it becomes harder to keep you know, stable. And so you wanna have as few edges as possible, but squares don't make a nice sphere. So we go, we go hex. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, here's an interesting question. Um, are you able to comment on the relative scale of the circumgalactic medium and uh, dark matter halos of most galaxies? Ah, yes, they're about the same size. And oh. the, the, re the reason is that um, the circumgalactic medium has largely not collapsed to form stars. So the, the atoms are basically following the dark matter in some cases, except for the outflows. But the, the general halo shape maps very well on to the dark matter distribution because the atoms are just gonna go wherever the dark matter is since it outweighs it 10 to one, right? And so it's just gonna kind of flow in the stream of wherever the dark matter is going. And, and Alan, I see your comment about bees figuring out the values of hex a long time ago. Yeah, they did. The bees are much smarter than we are. Uh, but we all know it was Spitzer who came up with the idea. Yeah, right? and Lyman Spitzer probably taught the bees. The yeah, exactly, was. yeah. Um, can, can the orbital velocities of the circumgalactic medium regions be measured, and do they have the same pattern as visible galaxies? Does this hint at the same dark matter density that the visible galaxy orbital speed shows? Yeah, basically, if, if for the same reason that I was saying before, in the outer parts of the galaxies, the gas is too diffuse, so it just kind of follows where the dark matter is going, with the exception of the stuff that's ejected by supernovae. So if there's, if there's stuff flowing in, it's because there's a local overdensity of dark matter that's in, in the cosmic web. If there's stuff just hanging out, it's because that's the outer halo of the galaxy. And it should be co-rotating with, with the dark matter and the, the very few stars out there that we see to measure the, the, the rotation of the galaxy with the rotation curve. So they, they all, they all kind of commingle except for when it goes uh, due, due to supernovae. <laughs> Um, so with the, with the Keck telescope, I, there's, uh, there's kind of a pair of telescopes there and, um, do you use interferometry to kind of combine the light to create a better angular resolution? We did for many years. Keck did have an interferometer where there is a, a huge set of what we call long and short delay lines, these mirrors that have to move back and forth really fast on rails and all that stuff to combine the light very, very precisely. And we ran the interferometer for a number of years. Um, but uh, the interferometer project ended, it, it basically reached the conclusions that it could with that aperture, that separation, and, and that system. Um, and so we no longer do inter interferometry. In fact, we've cleaned out the basement because we're putting in a hypersensitive spectrograph to measure exoplanets going around other stars, um, ideally to try to get us down into the regime where we could measure something like the Earth orbiting around a star like the Sun at the same separation as the Earth and the Sun. For that, you need a spectrograph that is extremely stable, extremely sensitive, and that's why we cleaned out the basement mirror or building it there. 
coming online next year. Well, that's that's awesome. Um, just another another question. Um, you know, you do a lot of the work on Mauna Kea, but you mentioned that um, you may have um, been to Chile as well. Do you have any yeah. pros and cons of Mauna Kea versus the Atacama Desert? I hear both are really good for astronomy. Well, so I will say that, so when the, the picture of me next to the Magellan telescopes and um, just on the edge of the Atacama, um, the skies are absolutely beautiful in the Southern Hemisphere because you can see the large and small match on the clouds and you usually get a better view of the Milky Way. And in fact, there was one night in Chile where I could, I could tell after being an, an hour or two dark adapted out there that the Milky Way itself was casting a shadow. And nothing changes your perspective like being in a place dark enough for the Milky Way to cast a shadow. Um, most of the Atacama where they build optical telescopes is lower in elevation, however, right? So uh, Las Campanas is at about 10,000 feet, whereas Mauna Kea is at 14,000 feet. And so we have about 15, 20% less atmosphere than those places do, which for ultraviolet wavelengths makes Mauna Kea a superior site to most places except for the very high Atacama, um, which is at 18,000 feet and really nasty to work at. I mean, that's just, you think 14 is bad, 18 is worse. Um, so compared to places like the very large telescope or the Magellan telescopes and all that, for certain types of astronomy, uh, Mauna Kea cannot be beat because we can't build those telescopes and expect people to work and live there in the Atacama. And also because the Milky Way is getting, is getting in a little bit more of the way um, if you're trying to do big extra galactic work, you know, the galaxy is annoying. Get that, get that stuff out of my way. Um, so it really depends on the type of science you're doing, the wavelengths you're trying to do. Um, but the Atacama, you know, the, the Atacama, Mauna Kea and Dome C on Antarctica are probably the best three places on the planet to, to do astronomy. Um, it's just that if you want to find me, you know, hundred people want to work at Dome C, uh, you know, for six months at a stretch, that's 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 hard work so well that's that's hilarious um well that's that's it for questions i'm just wondering if you have any final comments that you'd like to to share with this group no i think it's it, it was wonderful questions from from everybody <clears throat> excuse me wonderful questions from everybody thank you very much for 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 joining me tonight um one thing if you if you want to see more presentations from our keck astronomers if you go to keckobservatory.org um, there's a section up there that says, I think it's cosmic matters or whatever it is. We have a, a public uh, talk series. Our next one is in fact next week um, on, on July 20th. People, uh, Monsi Kaslawal from, from Caltech is talking about big explosions in the sky, supernovae, gravitational wave events, etc. And we do about th those about once a month. They're open to the public. You can join either on Zoom like this or on Facebook Live. So I encourage people to do that. You can watch old uh, versions of this. If you like learning more about how the telescope works, I gave a presentation a few months back about a, sort of a night in the life of the, the telescope, how that works. But um, mostly just thank you everybody for, for coming for the great questions and for, for your interest. Um, and, you know, love to do it again sometime soon. Thank you so much for, for such an amazing presentation. And, um, you know, I think it was thoroughly enjoyed by, by everybody here. So, you know what, thank you very much. And um, in closing, uh, I'll just, uh, I'll just um, briefly share my, my screen one more time and, and just say, if, if you have, um, uh, if you have any, uh, questions about uh, about the Calgary Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, please feel free to drop into one of our many social media outlets. Or um, if you'd like to talk to a person, you can you can send an email to me directly, um, simonjastronomy at gmail.com. And as I mentioned, our Telescope for Rent program will be opening in August. So it's it's been a long time coming. And we're really excited to get more eyes into the skies through through some of these great telescopes that are here on the on the slide right now. So um, again, uh, Dr. Omira, I'd like to um, thank you again for such a, a wonderful evening um, where we learned so many great things. And you know, the Keck Observatory is something that's very exciting to a lot of people. A lot of people. Um, know of it and and you know to kind of experience you know somebody who who works there is 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 just amazing 
And I'd also like to thank our um, representatives from the, the Calgary Public Library for hosting this amazing event. Um, so thank you very, very much. And, thank you very much, Calgary Public Library. Uh, I'd like to I'd like to turn it over to um, you at the the library to to close us out. So thank you everybody for for coming this evening. Thank you, thank you, uh, Royal uh, Astronomical Society of Canada for presenting this uh, um, excellent presentation on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, I mean, as you can see from the chat, it's there's, uh, it's very well liked. Uh, thank you, Dr. John o Omira and uh, Simon for moderating it and our attendees for uh, participating. Uh, we do have upcoming six astronomy programs for kids. Uh, it's run by, again, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Uh, those are binocular astronomy, meteor astronomy, Milky Way, the planets and the seasons and orbits. Uh, these presentations are going to be for ages six to 12 years old. So if anyone is uh, knows kids or have kids and you want to register them, please go online to calgarylibrary.ca slash programs to register for those programs. And thank you for joining us tonight.